Hello, church. We're going to get back into the book of Proverbs. Since the pandemic, we've been looking at elements related to the pandemic, and we've tried to address those very timely topics that hopefully have been a help to you. But I think you, like myself, we're ready to get back to a sense of normality, aren't we? We're looking to get back into a regular routine, and hopefully our leaders will start to open things up and allow for us to do that. But until we get back into church and until we're having prayer meeting, I'm going to get back into the book of Proverbs anyways and try to provide some of that routine when it comes to our midweek devotion. Uh, Book of Proverbs, I love it. It's my favorite book in the Bible. Solomon is my favorite author in the Bible. I just think the book of Proverbs is so important to the success of every Christian man and woman, and especially to the success of every Christian boy and girl. I think everyone should be reading a proverb a day. I don't think it's a coincidence that there are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. Of course, most months in our calendar have 31 days in it. And so a proverb a day, as I often say, keeps the devil away. So we should be reading Proverbs every day. That being said, it's a very intense book. Some of the Proverbs are easy to understand and to grasp. Others are not. There's just a ton of meat there. And when you read a chapter a day, there's a lot you can grab. But if you read it every day, every year, throughout your whole life, these Proverbs will be ingrained into your heart and into your mind. And they will come up to the surface when you need them. Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 7, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. You've got to have wisdom if you're going to succeed in this world. And the book of Proverbs is key in getting that wisdom, because wisdom comes through the Word of God. Wisdom comes from above, as James says in the New Testament. And so read it, read it, read it, be familiar with it. And and if we can get our young people reading the book of Proverbs a chapter a day, it really will change their life. I believe that wholeheartedly, and uh, I personally am so grateful for this book, and that's why we've been going through it slowly. I would really encourage parents to take careful note to these lessons. Uh, young people, young adults, uh, in, in including teenagers, please, parents, have them listen to these lessons or reteach them to your kids, because so many of them will apply to young people. Solomon is writing to his son. It's a father-to-son letter. Therefore, you're dealing primarily with issues of youth, but they are universal. These are issues that all of us deal with. Young people just often lack the wisdom to deal with life that elderly people have. And so the the letter is given to his son to hopefully help him learn these lessons without having to go through the hard times that teach those lessons. So parents... Definitely tune in. I hope everybody's tuning in, but I want young people eventually and ultimately to get this information. But we're going to jump back where we were into chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles handy, get them out and open to Proverbs chapter 5. We'll read the first few verses, which we have already gone through in previous lessons, all of which are available online. Most of them are in blog form, so you'd need to read those, uh, but lately I've been recording the audio so you can listen to some of the uh, in, in time, uh, real time, rather le- <coughs> lessons, excuse me, that we gave. Now we'll be doing some video just because you can't be here, and hopefully it will engage you a little more just to, to know you can get uh, everything included here. But let's read Proverbs chapter 5 together as we look at a lesson tonight called A Foolish Forfeit. A Foolish Forfeit. Proverbs chapter 5, verse number 1. My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and her, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable." that thou canst not know them. He says in verse 7, Hear me now therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. So he's speaking to more than just his son, although you'll see the phrase my son over and over and over throughout the book. He is speaking obviously to more than just his son now when he says in verse 8, 
remove thy way far from her and come not nigh the door of her house. He's saying, listen, young people, stay far away from the wrong person. Stay far away from that, that wrong woman that you're romantically attracted to. Stay wrong, uh, far away from that wrong man that you're looking to be involved with romantically. Stay far away. Don't even flirt with them. Don't even try to, to get involved in a relationship because it won't work out. And then he says in verses 9 through 14, this is why I don't want you to get involved with the wrong person lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. And say, how have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. There's an exclamation point there, meaning there is great sorrow eventually when you get into the wrong relationship and you realize where you've been. And then he says in verse 14, you will say this at the end. You will say, I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. Now, By means of introduction, we live in a world of takers. People are takers. Creatures are takers. Nature is even a taker. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. We live in a world where people will take what we have. We live in a world where where creatures will take what we have. And so we have to lock our doors, arm our security systems, come up with very clever and intricate passwords for our online accounts, or else people and things will take from us what we have. If we leave our cars unlocked, people will go in and take our change. If we leave our doors unlocked, people will come in and steal uh, the medicine from our cabinets. If we leave uh, our windows unlocked, people will come in. If we leave the holes and and cracks in our houses uh, unfixed, creatures will come in. If we're not vigilant in this world in which we live, somebody's going to slip their hand into our pocket and take our phone out. If we don't make sure we have extra security on our uh, online accounts, people will hack into them and steal all kinds of money. We've got problems in this world, and they range from people who are very intelligent to creatures who aren't so intelligent. Ants make their way in. They march in, and they take what they want. Hopefully, they're not the carpenter ants that start to work away at your wood. But you will have little rodents come in if you don't secure your home, if you don't protect your home. Rodents will come in and take your food. I remember in our first house, we were there for some time, and uh, there was a brief time in our, in our stay there that I heard some things in the closets and in the walls, and so we put the traps around and caught a few creatures, and, and eventually that sound went away, and uh, we didn't catch any more creatures. When we finally moved... I don't know, a year or two later, I moved a a bookshelf out of my study there in the home. And and mind you, we have a very clean home. My wife is a clean freak, so we have a very clean home. But I moved that shelf away, and underneath that shelf were were carefully placed piles of Cheerios, because we had young children at the time. Uh, I think there was some popcorn in there. But the rodent was, was getting his own supply of food right there under my shelf. Very organized little rodent, by the way. And uh, he was taking from us. He didn't pay for that. He didn't ask permission. He took it from us. You know, nature will do that too. If we don't listen to the engineers and build properly, waves, wind, and earthquakes will come in and take away our businesses. They'll take away our homes. They'll take away our buildings. This world takes, whether in the form of people, creature, or nature. That's just what it is. It's a world of takers. Everyone seems to want something, and they seem to want everything that we have. The government wants our money. Businesses constantly are are trying to get our money through advertisement. Uh, Thieves want our things. People want our time, our affection. They want our attention. Everybody seems to want something. And to survive this hungry world, we need to learn to protect what we have. To survive this unsatisfied world, we need to learn to hold on to what we possess. Now this 
truth, this idea of learning to hold on to what we have, to cherish what we possess, is a truth that is learned best, although not ideal, by experience. The longer we live, the more we see things being taken from us, and when things are taken from us, then we learn to preserve and protect the things we still have. Uh, I now lock the doors of my cars in my own driveway. I never used to do that. I do that now. You say, why do you do that now? Because one night someone broke into my car. In fact, they didn't break into it. They just opened it, and they took an MP3 player. They took the change in my car. They took my clergy badge. So somebody is running around pretending to be Reverend Kevin Cable, I guess. And uh, they took my gum, of all things. So now I lock my door because I know what it feels like to have things taken from me. Those of you watching and listening right now, you probably now lock the doors of your house because at some point somebody broke into your home and they took jewelry. Now maybe you're the person who has extra uh, type of safety precautions in your passwords. Nobody in the world could possibly figure them out and you can't even remember them because they're so complicated because someone hacked into your accounts and, and took money from you. Maybe you're the person who had that squirrel get in and, and take some of your sanity because they drove you nuts for weeks or months on ends. And so now you have every possible corner of the house boarded up and sealed up and there's no way somebody's going to get in there and take from you anything. But we learn by experience that the world takes from us. The world even takes our machinery if we don't use the right equipment and it rusts and it, it, it gets broken. So now you probably are the type of person, if you've had a machine break down because of rust, you have uh, all the right materials, you've sealed and coated everything. We learn by age because age brings experience. And although they say experience is the best teacher, uh, it's not the, 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 the most ideal teacher. It may be the most effective because we learn the hard way oftentimes, but it shouldn't be that way. We should learn by watching others. We should learn by listening to others. And that's what Solomon's trying to do here with his young son, with his young children. He's trying to get them to learn through him, to not have to go through the hard lessons, to not have to live life and learn these lessons and in the process lose a lot of time and pleasure because of learning the hard way. And that's what he's saying here in this passage. When we are young, we often don't realize how, how limited our, our blessings and our, our treasures and our possessions are in this life. When we're young, we think that the world is ahead of us. We have all the, the time in the world. We have all the effort available, all the energy available. And so we waste time typically the best things. When we're young, we don't take care of our health because we think it'll always be great. It's as we get older. Maybe it's after you're cutting a piece of wood and a little, a little fragment gets into your eye and you then realize how valuable your vision is, then you start wearing eye protection. But when you're young, they, you know, young people get money and they spend it because they don't realize it doesn't grow on trees. When you're young, you don't necessarily redeem the time. You don't use your time very wisely because you have, in your mind, all the time in the world. And young people don't know this lesson as well as old people. That's why if you look at a young person and compare them to an elderly person, a young person tends to be relatively careless with the valuable things God has given them because they don't realize how easy it is to lose and that there's not a limitless supply of it. Older people, having gone through life, they tend to cherish what they have, and they also tend to be far more protective. You could argue paranoid at times. There are just two separate mindsets based entirely on age, because age brings experience or a lack of inexperience, <clears throat> a lack of experience, depending on what you know, side of the spectrum you're on there. Now, because youth and experience and inexperienced, rather, fail to teach the need to protect that which is valuable, young people are prone to give away that which they'll never get back. And so an older, wiser Solomon, a father figure, is telling his children, don't give away that which you can't get back. Don't give away willingly that which people will take uh, on their own accord. Learn to cherish those things that you have 
Learn to keep those things that are good. The things that God gives you in life, don't take them for granted. Don't throw them away flippantly. Make sure you protect them. But in teaching his children to protect these things, he doesn't tell them you need to go out and buy a security system. He doesn't tell them you need to go learn martial arts. He doesn't tell them that you need to come up with very complicated passwords to protect these things. No, what he's about to tell them is so important for every young person, every aged person, but every young person especially needs to hear very clearly what Solomon is saying. He says to his children, to young people abroad, he says, stay far away from the wrong person when it comes to romantic relationships. You're going to give up willingly. You're going to voluntarily forfeit valuable things if you get into the wrong relationship. He says, don't go anywhere near this lady. Don't go anywhere near the door of her house. If you do, you're going to give up things. And in a world, a world of takers, you can't afford to give up your resources. You can't afford to give up those valuable blessings that God has given you to build your life on. You see, God gives us abilities. God gives us opportunities. God gives us, in many ways, a clean slate as young people. And you are to use those things to build the success of the rest of your life. But... If you get into the wrong relationship, you will give those things away willingly because you will not take them seriously. And as a result, your life will suffer. And in this passage, in uh, verses number 9 through 14, Solomon is going to address seven things that a young person will foolishly forfeit because of love. Now think about love. Love is which is very powerful, it's very strong, it's universal. Men and women, boys and girls experience love. What is love? Love is that which makes us sacrifice. Love always leads to a, a willing uh, gift to somebody else. God himself, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world, number one, that he gave his only begotten son, number two. Love produces gifts because the emotion of love, for it to be true love, for it to be genuine love, to be authentic love, there should be a sacrifice to show and prove that love. And when you get involved in a romantic relationship, young people, you are going to naturally give something up for that relationship. You're going to willingly forfeit something. And if you are in the wrong relationship, if you're romantically in love with the wrong person, you will forfeit things, and they will be foolish things to give up. Uh, the first thing I want you to see that Solomon points out is honor. Honor. Verse number 9, he says to his children, stay far away from this lady, lest thou give thine honor unto others. See, she isn't stealing it. She's not taking it. People aren't breaking into this, you know, to this young man's hypothetical life and taking away his honor, taking away his reputation. No, Solomon says stay away from her because you will voluntarily give your honor away. Getting involved with the wrong romantic relationship will ruin your reputation. You will go where she wants you to go. You will do what he wants you to do. And as a result, your family and your friends and the people that know you well will watch you lose the character you once had, and they will ask themselves, what's happened to our son, to our brother, to our friend? What's happened to our daughter, to our sister, to our friend? Why are they giving up uh, on their values? Why are they giving up on things that they once strongly believed in and why are they going where they want them to go or doing what they want uh, them to do what's happening here a and eventually you will find if you're in the wrong relationship you will lose the respect that comes with being a godly man or woman and when you lose that respect it is something that is not easily regained if ever and I fear that young people, because they don't value reputation, because their whole life is ahead of them and they're learning about life, they don't value what Solomon spoke of in Proverbs chapter 22, which is a good name is better to be chosen than great riches. Your reputation is so valuable. Your reputation means everything truthfully as you're developing and as you're trying to get an occupation, a career, established relationships that will last lifetime, uh, 
the reputation is so important uh, to the cause of Christ and everything you do. If you get into the wrong romantic relationship, you will willingly give up your honor. You will willingly give up your respect. And realize, if you do that, it will be so hard to get back. Don't give up something that God has given you, especially if you've been raised in a good godly home. Don't throw it away over the wrong relationship. Secondly, Solomon says, you will willingly give up not only your honor, but you will give up your hours. Look at verse number nine again. He says, lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years unto the cruel. Uh, getting involved with the wrong ro romantic relationship will waste your precious time. And your time is precious. Your time is precious. Again, young people, uh, and all of us do this based on our age. As we age, we have a greater appreciation for time. As we age, we see how quickly it goes and fades, and we begin to value the hours and seconds and minutes of our lives. But the younger we are, we think we have our whole lives ahead of us, and we're willing to waste time doing any number of things. In this case, Solomon says if you get into the wrong romantic relationship, you will waste your time on the cruel. And what he's saying there is the wrong, ro ro the wrong romantic relationship, a lot, of, a lot of R sounds in that, if you're in that relationship, eventually, assuming it's wrong, eventually you'll, you'll learn that the person you have given your heart to is cruel. They only care about themselves. They only want you to do what they want them to do. And, and in this case, they're a stranger. That's the wording Solomon uses. It's very common in the Old Testament. It's a reference to those people who are not of the Jewish people or who are not of that family. But in, in application here, it's anybody who doesn't know your God. They're strange to them. The spiritual Christian principles are strange to them, and therefore they are a stranger and if you get involved with a stranger, you will find out that they are cruel. You will find out eventually that they're only interested in personal pleasure or personal gain. And when you eventually discover and finally admit that you've been in the wrong romantic relationship, you'll have learned that you have wasted years of your young life on a cruel person. And what a tragedy to wake up one day and realize you've given a year, two, three, four, five years of your young life, the time when you were the healthiest, the time when you were the most vibrant, the time when you had the most to offer, and you've given it to somebody who was cruel, somebody who wasted your time. Don't give up your time. It's too precious. Don't give it up for the wrong person. Hang on to it. Use it for the right things. Thirdly, Solomon says you'll give up your hire. He says in verse 10, if you go to the house of a strange woman, uh, you'll give up your honor and your years. And he says, let strangers be filled with thy wealth. You know, if you get involved with the wrong romantic relationship, it'd be a waste of your treasure, be a waste of your wealth, be a waste of your money. Uh, romantic relationships are expensive. Romantic relationships, primarily because of the activities that are involved with dating, they're expensive. And when you're involved with somebody romantically, money is always going to be involved because as I said a few moments ago, uh, love produces or should produce a sacrifice, meaning you're going to give to prove and show your love. And so when you love somebody and you're, you're investing in them romantically, you're going to spend money on them. And as you spend money on them, that's money you just don't get back. It's, it's not money that as you empty your bank account or swipe the card, it automatically gets filled back up. No, you had to work hard for that. You had to get that from somewhere. And if you're spending money on the wrong person, on the wrong relationship, they're getting your money, you're getting nothing in return. It's what's called a bad investment. And how sad to wake up a year, two, three, four, five years into a bad relationship with the wrong person and realize, looking backwards, wow, not only did I waste those years, those, those days, those hours, but I wasted dollars and cents. Every dime I spent, it's gone. There's no return on it. I get nothing out of it. So Solomon is urging the young people listening to him not to waste thousands of dollars on an investment with no return. He says, number four, 
that you're willing to give up for the wrong person, hard work. Verse number 10 again, it says, lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. Getting involved with the wrong romantic relationship will be a waste of time, it will be a waste of money, but it also will be a waste of sweat. Relationships, all of them, not just romantic relationships, but all of them take a lot of effort to work. Romantic relationships, I would argue, take the most amount of effort to work because you're getting that much closer to a person. You're getting that much involved with a person. And when it comes to a man and a woman being so different by divine design, coming together is that much more harder. It takes that much more effort. It takes that much more labor. And when you're involved with a relationship, you're trying to prove to that other person you love them, you're doing things to show them you care for them. That takes a lot of effort, a, a lot of labor. You will do that. You'll willingly give up your sweat. You willingly will give up your calories. You will willingly give up your time and effort for a person that you love. Here's the problem. You only have so much effort in you, just like you only have so much time in you. You can't give your effort to everybody. You can't give your work to everybody. You can't give your labor to everybody. If you're spending it all on one person, you're investing in that relationship and that person. If that's the wrong person and the wrong relationship, then it's wasted effort. It's wasted sweat equity. And it's sad to see young people spend their time, money, and effort on bad relationships when they could be spending them on godly relationships. It's sad to see youth wasted on wrong romantic relationships when it could be spent on far more profitable efforts such as serving God, such as building your faith. If you're, in, if you're in the wrong romantic relationship, you're going to put a lot more effort into that relationship than you are going to be in the relationship with God. The effort required to pray, the effort required to read your Bible, the effort required to meditate, the effort required to serve God in ministry capacities. You can't give your effort to everyone. And if you're giving it to the cruel, to the wrong person in a wrong romantic relationship, you are giving your labors and your wealth and your years to the wrong person. And you can't get that back. You can't get it back. It's a foolish forfeit of a blessing of God. Number five, Solomon says you're going to also forfeit your happiness. In verse number 11, he says, And thou mourn at the last. And thou mourn at the last. Meaning, you start out with this person that you think you really like. You eventually give them your heart. You give them your love. But what you don't realize, if it's the wrong relationship with the wrong person who has no appreciation for God, who has no allegiance to God, who has no respect for Christianity, who has no desire to follow Christ, if you're in that relationship, eventually, at the last, you will mourn. Every wrong relationship, every wrong romantic relationship will eventually come to an end. It doesn't work. It can't work. It can't work. And so when it eventually comes to an end, that's when you realize when you gave your heart to somebody, you gave your happiness to somebody. Young people, the younger we are, the more likely we are to be happy, full of vibrance, full of optimism, the older we get, we experience more of this world, and this world gives us a lot of reasons to be sorrowful. The world will make us sorry whether we want to or not. It will take people from us. It will, it will bring tragedy into our lives, and we will be sorrowful. But while we are young, while we have not yet experienced much of the world, we're more likely to be upbeat and happy. You know what you should do while you're young? Is be happy. Be optimistic. Be optimistic. Be, be hopeful. Uh, put, put your soul in and, and put everything into your life and just invest in it with the help of God. Don't waste your happiness. Don't waste your vibrance on the wrong relationship. You don't want to be in a relationship that when it finally comes to an end, an end and you finally realize it didn't work, that you look back and you say, oh man, I spent the best part of my life with the wrong person. And what sorrow comes with that tears will stream down your cheeks. There will be heartbreak because you will realize you have wasted your emotional youth on the wrong person. 
Don't willingly forfeit happiness because she looks good or because he promises big things. Number six, Solomon says you, you will foolishly forfeit a number of things if you get involved with the wrong person. And the sixth thing is your health. Verse number 11, he says, And thou will mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. Getting involved with the wrong romantic relationship almost always leads to the willing forfeit of sound sexual health. The wrong romantic relationships of this world eventually become physically immoral relationships, and with such relationships come great risks. Fornication brings with it the risk of STD or unwanted pregnancies. Fornication, unfortunately, brings perpetual guilt that seems forever attached to the person you see in the mirror every morning and every evening. Young person, please hear me clearly. Giving away your virginity is the foolish forfeit of something precious. It, like time, can never be regained. It, like time, can never be regained. Once you give it up, and you'll do so willingly, it can never be retrieved. Listen, in a world of takers, it's hard enough to protect our body. But in the wrong romantic relationship, a clean body is often willingly given up. Don't give it up because you will mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. And then number seven, Solomon says the wrong romantic relationship will lead to a willing forfeit of honor, of hours, of hire, of hard work, of happiness, of health, and number seven, of holiness. He says in verse number 11, And thou wilt mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. And you will say, verse 12, to yourself, How have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. And you will conclude at the end when things fall apart in that wrong romantic relationship that I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. The wrong person being romantically involved will make you lose your morality, your holiness, all the virtue and good that God wants you to have. You may be raised in a good Christian home. You may be going to a good church. You may have good teaching at your disposal, and you may have all the potential, spiritually speaking, in the world. But if you give your heart to the wrong man, if you give your heart to the wrong woman, and you go down that path of being romantically involved with them, Eventually that will come to an end and you will look back and you will look at the wasted spirituality. You will be w looking back at the wasted blessings, spiritually speaking. You will see your lack of morality. You will see your lack of holiness and it will grieve you. And you will look back and realize you can't get that back. Now, God always provides room for repentance. Praise the Lord for it. God always provides room for mercy and forgiveness. And he can wash away uh, the sins of our youth. And he can take away uh, the guilt and regret by the blood of Christ. Praise the Lord for it. We all need that for all ages at all times. But you don't have to go through that. You don't have to give that up. You don't have to give up your holiness you don't have to give up your morality. You don't have to look back and see your youth as something you're ashamed of or something you wish you could change. It's important that you choose not the security system uh, in life, not all the good things that will protect you from criminals or from hackers. When it comes to cherishing the treasures that God gives you, when it comes to protecting the blessings that come with your youth, Solomon says the most important thing you've got to do is guard your heart from giving it to the wrong person. Oh, he may be a nice guy. She may be a, even a moral person. He may be a, a good dude. She may be a kind woman. But that doesn't make that the right relationship to be romantically invested in. If they don't agree with you spiritually, if they don't agree more importantly with the Bible, if they don't have Christ as their Savior, if they don't have God as their Father, if they don't have the biblical principles as their leaders in their life, 
It's the wrong romantic relationship, and it will eventually lead you to willingly give up the things that the world will eventually try to take. It will lead you to foolishly forfeit the treasures that God has given to you. Those building blocks that, you're, that will allow your life to be successful. Solomon says you've got to guard your heart from giving those things up. Don't foolishly forfeit anything for the wrong romantic relationship. Give your heart to God first and foremost. He won't break it. And let him give your heart to the right man or woman of his choice. Because in that relationship, you will still sacrifice for sure. But you will not have all the regret and the sorrow that comes with this passage here in Proverbs chapter 5. God bless you.